All right, folks, we'll get back to that in just moments here, but we do we have some uh, breaking news that we want to bring to you uh, right here on Live Now from Fox New York Times. Found not liable in the Sarah Palin case here. The New York Times did not defame former Alaska Governor Sarah Palin. A jury concluded just moments ago the verdict is largely symbolic. The judge has already said Pal Palin failed to prove her case and vowed to dismiss her lawsuit. Uh, the judge said Palin failed to prove the Times Act it with, quote, actual malice when it inaccurately linked her to a 2011 mass shooting in an editorial. As a public figure, Palin faced a higher legal burden than the average citizen to prove defamation. The, the, ju the jury verdict will factor in Palin's expected appeal. Free speech advocates warned that the lawsuit has the potential to upend decades of legal precedent and restrict press freedom should it reach the Supreme Court there. So uh, we will keep an eye on this story here. This is all uh, going back to the Erroneous editorial that was uh, published in the wake of a mass shooting at a congressional baseball game in Virginia back in 2017 that left Representative Steve Scalise seriously wounded. The editorial argued that heated political rhetoric could lead to real world violence and cited the 2011 mass shooting by Jarrett. Lofner that led six people dead in the former representative Gabby Giffords badly injured. In a sentence quoted throughout the trial, the editorial said the link to political incite incitement was clear in the Giffords attack. It inaccurately reported that a map graphic circulated by Palin's PAC showed crosshairs over Giffords and other Democrats. But the map actually featured targets over Democrats' electoral districts, not the officials themselves there. So we'll keep an eye definitely on this as I uh, just wanted to reiterate, New York Times found not liable in this case here. All right, welcome to yet another session of Com Law Ethics and Diversity. And for today's session, we're going to be looking specifically at defamation, libel, and slander. And I've played that video so that you can be primed to understand exactly what we're going to be looking at in the context of public figures and their involvement in these types of defamation cases. You will find as we go through the session that any person can be actually um, brought before the courts for a defamation case, and notwithstanding the fact that in a lot of instances, you will find that the majority of those who are filing um, those cases are public figures. And so we'll go right into the session. I'll share my slides too. Excuse me. And so defamation, libel, and slander. Let's first start with a definition of what defamation is. Now, it is any untruthful speech that harms an individual's reputation and subjects the individual to ridicule. Just to give you a bit of background in case you weren't following the case of Sarah Palin in the New York Times, um, it really resided around the shooting that occurred that happened with um, Gabby Giffords. And it was alleged that, you know, Sarah Palin's argument was that the New York Times attributed her statement to um, the shooting as, as something that was really motivated on the basis of what was said in terms of the rhetoric. And so there was really cause for concern by the New York Times in terms of attribution. They did not directly attribute. And so the argument really of the court is that what Sarah Palin was attempting to do was to really issue that gag that we spoke about just I think last week or the week before in terms of stifling the freedom of the press to editorialize or to state what is actually happening. So she drew that connection, but the burden of proof is usually on the side of the person who comes forward to make the allegations. And so the court did not find any um, culpability on the part of New York Times. So the statement has to be established as untruth speech. Now, there's a distinction between what is called libel and slander. And so anything that is written in terms of defamatory remarks, they're referred to as libel, pronounced libel. And of course, if it's spoken, if it's broadcasted, it is called slander. So those are the distinctions. Now, the question might be who can actually sue for defamation? 
anyone who's not acting on behalf of the government or a government agency, they actually have the power to sue an entity, an organization, an individual for defamation. So these include businesses and companies and conglomerates, non-governmental organizations, nonprofits and charities, they can all sue. And in this particular image here, you'll see the dental health company, they filed a $2.8 billion lawsuit against NBC for um, what they alleged to be a uh, misrepresentation of what they represented as a company. Now for someone to sue, they've got to be alive. So it means that anyone who's handling somebody else's estate cannot sue on the person's behalf. An example that I have here is Michael Jackson's estate, which attempted to sue the HBO company for making that Leaving Neverland documentary that really highlighted the issues around the child abuse allegations. Um, and so he died. And so they could not have actually gone forward with that particular lawsuit in his absence as someone who is no longer here to defend the actual case. So the debt cannot sue. The government or government agencies are federal employees in their official capacity because really the whole notion of the First Amendment speaks to freedom of speech and freedom of information. And so if the government comes forward, it's actually inimical to the First Amendment to the constitution directly, and it's going to be seen as a case of censorship. And so if the government is saying that we are suing you, then the government is effectively saying that we are trying to muzzle you. We're trying to place a gag order because we don't want you to necessarily keep us accountable as office holders. Um, and you will see the reason why I'm bringing these examples is not to say that other administrations do not have examples, but I'm bringing the Trump examples not because I have a political ax or um, some sort of motive it's because these are very recent examples um he often said that you know he would like to open up defamation and libel laws to make it easy to sue the organizations um for instance you know if we go back to new york times versus sullivan i'm going to come to that later on in this particular module you will see that it's really going against the grain of press freedom and that very very early case that we spoke about with the watergate scandal um, based on what happened under the Nixon administration. So attempts at actually trying to, um, you know, gag or to censor the press, they have been met with, you know, the types of pushback by the Supreme Court as a result of really adhering to the First Amendment um, and what the Constitution says. Now, for those who can be sued for defamation, it means that publishers, you just see in the example where Sarah Palin actually lost out to that particular case against the New York Times, and so writers and editors and companies have got to be very mindful of um, individuals coming to bring these particular cases. Students can also be sued for defamation. Um, you know, if a student decides to defame a professor, if a student decides to defame a teacher, if a student decides to defame another student, um, willfully um, taking somebody's information out of context or lying, um, about somebody's character. All of these are cases where um, writers, editors, companies, and students, even website operators and graphic artists and headline writers, um, public relations individuals, they can all be sued for defamation. And in this image here, you'll see that BuzzFeed actually won a defamation suit against dossier publication. So if you look at some of the, the landmark cases, you will find that the um, burden was not actually um, one, it was not proven by the side that were trying to defend themselves in bringing to light the particular lawsuits. Now, who can be sued? The government can actually be sued, government agency. So whereas the government cannot sue, they can actually be sued. Federal employees acting in their official capacity cannot be sued for defamation. So if somebody in the government really, you know, if you, 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 you actually releasing unverified information regarding potential criminals or terrorists. Um, it is good to warn people to facilitate their arrest, but when it comes to um, the lawsuit, it has to be really accurate, right, in terms of the allegation. Now, many of these individuals are sometimes found to be innocent, and so it's very, 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 very important, and I'm stressing the word very, that editors and all those persons who are actually putting people's faces and stories in the public domain that they have the information, the beyond the shadow of a doubt of preponderance evidence to make the particular published um, um, results um, 
in the public domain so that these individuals, whenever they're actually deemed to be innocent in the court of law, um, you do not um, find yourself with a lawsuit. So if they're found to be innocent, like Sunil Tripathi, who was wrongfully named the Boston Marathon bomber, um, they can actually win their cases very easily. So there has to be some sort of caution on the part of those persons who are actually um, in published types of businesses, publications, so that before you're actually putting someone's name or image out there, you're very aware that what you have is truthful and not necessarily some concocted information or a hint or some sort of um, not you would have gotten by someone who think that they know the information is accurate, all right? So again, the government or government agencies or federal employees acting in their official capacity, they cannot be sued for defamation. They can speak the language of um, tentativeness in terms of having a person of interest, but they cannot necessarily um, be sued for defamation. Now, who, in terms of who can, defamation suits against the government could potentially prompt officials to withhold the identity of suspects. And so this is really a very tricky situation, all right? Another reason that some legal scholars cite is that if the government were to actually lose a defamation suit, uh, the American people would actually be penalized. Um, they will be the one paying through their tax dollars. So if they lost out and they have to pay out, then they'll have to find a way of getting back the money to recover costs as a result of losing the lawsuit. Um, moving right along, there are a couple of components of a libel suit that I'd like you to be very aware of. And these are defamation, falsity, identification, fault, and injury and damages. And so we'll go through this next. Now, for in terms of defamation, there are three types of defamatory comments, but we're going to examine two core types. And the first is libel per se. And this has to do with those statements that are obviously defamatory or false claim stated as a matter of fact and not opinion. Somebody gets on their podcast and they say, I have seen the president actually um, spending, he's really using taxpayers' dollars to buy homes or cars. Or I've seen the CEO of a particular company taking trips that are not authorized and stuff like that. So these are really obvious you know, statements that are, putting the person in disrepute without having the concrete evidence that is available. So they're not saying I believe or I think, but I know for a fact. So those matter of fact type of comments will actually be classified as libel per se for this to be brought to the court in this particular case. And so here are some examples of libel per se. Um, by saying that somebody has a loathsome disease, I know that that person has HIV or they have an STD or that person has committed serious misconduct. I believe that the governor is really a pedophile, or I believe that that person is actually a liar, and they've always lied and cheated on their adulterers. Or I, I saw that individual actually scamming somebody else online, or, you know, I believe he's a racist because there's not a single black person or there's not a single white person that is there um, in, in that assembly line. Have you seen the recruitment policy of his company. So these are libels per se, where you're actually just putting yourself in the position of knowing that the person is doing something. So the allegations are actually framed as factual. All right. Some ex other examples is accusing someone of being bankrupt. Like I know, have you seen them lately? They're in tatters. They're really, 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 um, you know, fallen by grace, um, you're fallen from grace, there's just no money in the account anymore. Or you're associating someone with a known criminal or incompetence as a profession. It's like saying, I know that professor cannot necessarily deliver. They don't know what they're talking about. So you're actually using that knowledge that you think you have about the person to talk about their, their, their type of, of job that they're doing or their profession. Um, claims that a business or a company provides poor service and rips off customers. Of course, this is also an example of libel per se. All right. If you have product reviews, this does not fall under the category. If somebody's actually saying about, you know, the product, please do not buy. This has been my experience. That's totally different. And that's established based on the experience rather than actually claiming that the company provides poor service without actually having the knowledge of the service that is delivered. Now, in the other, on the other side of this, a libel per quad, these 
really include publications that are not obviously defamatory, but they contain innuendo, colloquium, and of course, explanatory circumstances. And I'd like to draw your attention to the case of Morrison versus Ritchie and Company years ago, over a century ago, 1902. And this story is actually based on a false tip from a practical joker that Morrison had given birth to twins. She was married a month prior to the publication of the report, which implies that the twins were conceived before she got married. Now, if you know and understand culture back then, it was not necessarily a very practical, it was not a good joke to say that somebody had actually committed fornication um, because of the sensitive nature of this particular joke, all right? So the implicit implication here, or the implied thought or meaning here is that the person had done something that was immoral. And so even in today's communities, I, even if we're not going to go back to the early 1900s, um, you know, sex or premarital sex was really considered harmful to one's reputation. And so because it was not obviously defamatory, it was not liable per se, um, it was for caught, for, for quad meaning it was implied, um, it was taken to court, all right? So you can either be very explicit about what you're saying in the context of libel per se, or you can actually imply or have some sort of innuendo about someone and you can actually be brought to court for libel or fraud. Now, the third element or the second element I would say in terms of the examples of what will actually be components of a libel suit would be falsity. So we've just touched on defamation. Now I go to falsity. Falsity really, these are True statements, in fact, true statements are not considered defamatory no matter how much they harm someone's reputation. So you've got to prove whoever's taking the individual, the company, the publisher to court, they've got to prove that the material is false, all right? But who has to prove the falsity? The person who claims their reputation is actually being harmed. Now, in the case of Philadelphia newspaper versus Hepps 1986, not so, so long ago, the inquirer accused a businessman, Morris Hepps, of links to organized crime. And of course, they said that there was influence over the state legislature. So it's this whole linking or this association that was drawn between the businessman and those persons who were actually responsible for the bills and the legislature at the state level. So he sued the paper for defamation, argued um, that the paper has to prove that he's actually linked to organized crime. Um, the Philadelphia newspaper, which owned the Inquirer, they went to the Supreme Court and they argued that he should be the one who has to prove that the newspaper report is actually false. So actual falsity is really the burden of the person who's bringing the case to the court, the plaintiff. The Supreme Court agreed and ruled that he has to bear the burden of showing falsity as well as fault. The third now has to do with identification. So we touched on, you know, libel in the context of defamation. And now we go to identification, having touched on falsity. To claim your reputation is harmed, you actually have to prove that it was actually you who are being defamed in the article. In other words, there must be some name or face that is put to the publication. So for you to identify, this particular type of, you know, laws within your case, as the plaintiff, the public should have recognized you immediately, all right? Somebody who is not you should be able to say, hey, that is that particular student that I'm aware of comes, I'm, I, I was not even, you know, um, aware of, of, of the case, but now it seems as if this person is in real trouble. All right. So face and name, something that really says this is the individual tied to the case. This has to be established to actually file a particular claim of defamation. If your name through your picture or likeness, that's what I'm talking about. And of course, if your unique features identify you specifically, then you can claim that you have actually been seriously defamed because everybody's turning their heads in your direction as soon as you walk onto the campus or as soon as you walk into the classroom, hey, that's a person that we saw or we wrote, we, we actually read about or we saw on television or they're on this particular website as having stolen property, all right? Now, there are a couple of rules that govern what happens in cases when it comes to libel. Libelous remarks about a group of people makes identification very complicated. For instance, I'm teaching over 20 students in the class. And if I said that, you know, 
students are all you know very engaged or the students really they're sharing notes or i wonder what is going to happen with the mid-semester test or i think that every single student will actually bypass the lockdown browser um i you know i have not named a particular student okay i have not called anyone by what their major is or anything like that so this is what makes it very complicated if i were to actually do so then you have a strong case to actually bring a, a, a defamation suit against the professor who makes that allegation. So typically what courts have done, they've designated groups of fewer than 25 as identifiable. If I were teaching a class of let's say 10 of you, then if I said that that particular student who is actually working at X or Y place and who is one of my online students, um, and I've given some clear distinctions in terms of what they look like and what they're doing and what other courses they've done, then it's easy for the other classmates to say, hmm, I know that student. I've taken two or three classes with that student. And so the published defamatory remarks about the team, let's say, you know, KSU or CSU's football team as being incompetent or the entire class as being incompetent, any member of the team could actually sue if they're below 25 in terms of number, all right? So we, if everybody knows who the team members are, everybody knows who the class members are, you can actually sue because of this particular clause. Now for larger groups that are between 25 to 100, the courts will find blanket slurs, meaning that every single person, and an example here is COM 110 is incompetent. Again, this is, you know, not COM 110, this is really, Com law ethics and diversity 3400 and you know because of the numbers in the class you um are not necessarily as easily identifiable um than if you were like a pretty small group all right so for some students if we were to say some students are incompetent then you know they that might be an issue if i go down to identifying so group libel rules um are really much much easier to apply to smaller groups than they are to apply to larger groups in terms of really making um, the blanket slurs or statements. Now, groups of more than 100, like I said, that, that's even worse. They're not um, easily identifiable. And this is why when I first came into contact with this particular knowledge, um, I felt like, okay, so I was not even aware that this was happening. Um, racial slurs or hate speech directed at groups based on their religion or sexual orientation cannot be grounds for defamation suits. So I went, whoa. I was not even aware. Um, and of course, the example is if somebody were to say all openly gay men are incompetent, you have not necessarily said or called the name. And I've got an example there. It's like you cannot say all of them. And then Anderson Cooper jumps up and he decides that you're targeting him as a public figure because you did not call his name. You've just got him as an example. And there are quite a few other examples or persons who have come out and stuff like that and they're openly gay but once you do not call their name then they fall under that particular group libel rule um, of not establishing identification now the fourth in terms of, of how it is that we can actually use the published information to actually bring a case of defamation against someone whether it's a company or an organization is actual publication so we've established that you've got to identify they've got to establish falsity You've also got to establish that there is publication or proof of harm to reputation, meaning that when you've published, the material has to be printed or posted on the website. Once it's seen by at least one other person who's willing to testify, then publication is actually established. All right. So once it's in the public domain and you can prove that somebody has actually seen it, whether it's your friend or a relative or a classmate, then you can actually go ahead with this particular element that says, here it is, it's in the public domain. Now, a republication of libel, libelous material is the same as publication. Having downloaded and seen it, and then you've decided to just republish, that is really because you're doing double harm to the individual. So that's double indemnity as we call it, all right? So if you're, um, it's, it's, it's double jeopardy, not double indemnity. If your paper frequently publishes stories from buyer services, for instance, like, you know, the Associated Press or Agency France Press and other, um, you know, newspapers, you know, places like Reuters, then one of those articles, you know, if they turn out to be libelous, your newspaper can both be sued at the same time. I'm going to bring home an example. 
if you have an article that you've seen in the New York Times and the Atlanta Journal Constitution decides to republish without even checking the facts, then they can be sued for republication. So that's another example of how you can have a defense in terms of a defamation case or a lawsuit actually filed as a result of publication and republication of the libelous material. Now, the only exception is online republication, which is protected on the section 230. And we did speak about that, the fact that they're actually holding or they're the space there, the placeholder online, they're not necessarily responsible for the content, all right? So yes, they have to edit it. And of course, editing the content that alters meaning, rewriting story in your own words, but you're citing the sources, then they will not be held accountable. So they can actually be excluded in the context of actually saying that we're not the source, we got it from here or there. We can say according to the Atlanta Journal Constitution or according to the New York Times, all right? Now, engaging with the user to create discriminatory content, um, this can also be a case for a defamation suit as a result of that particular publication. And of course, also failing to comply with promises to remove the materials. After you've been told that this is falsity and falsity has been established, identification has been established and in the publication you're citing that, you know, this is really totally wrong. The information you've gotten is not correct. It does not represent who I am. And the particular site or company or the organization, the established media house decides to keep that thing there up online or in the public domain, then they can actually be sued for publication. All right. So knowingly not pulling that particular bit of material down can cause you to, fa to face a, a, a claim. Now, the fifth has to be fault. So apart from falsity, identification and publication, you've got to establish that fault is really what you're trying to prove on the part of whoever has defamed your character. Now, the plaintiff, again, proof of the defendants published defamatory speech, they've got to prove fault in that particular case, all right? So the defamatory remarks should not be seen as some sort of, you know, unanticipated error like a typo, but really what you're doing is willful. Um, you know, example, if you meant to say Stephen Colbert, but, you know, autocorrect, turn it to Stephen Colbert, and now Stevie is actually trying to super libel, he can because the fault is not established because really, Sometimes we do stuff and the information actually gets out there and it is not a fault of the person who's actually typing, but it's an autocorrect pattern. So fault has to be established beyond the shadow of a doubt. Now we move to negligence and actual malice. Now to establish actual malice, you must prove that either the publisher deliberately published falsity he knew that it was false or acted with reckless disregard for the truth. In other words, they did not necessarily check with other sources, all right? He, he would have known, he or she would have known for a fact that the material was 100% false and that some evidence questioned the veracity of the information. As journalism students, for those of you who are journalism majors, you would know that you've got to have at least three sources. Two of them have got to corroborate each other and one will probably be that little check there. I, I'm not so sure what I saw, but I think this is what I saw. And of course, two will say, well, I was there and I actually saw. So having three sources, um, having those particular bits and pieces of evidence, but not necessarily taking that into account, this is really classified as reckless disregard for the truth. So the publisher is acting with that reckless disregard and they're actually going through the whole process of negligence. And so the person can actually prove that there's actual malice because you're like, I don't need that from you. I want to hurt, hurt this person through some sort of act of malice. Now, you talk to three people, one gave you a juicy yet potentially libelous piece of gossip, two of them denied it, you went ahead with the story. Neither of them gave you concrete proof, so while there's a chance that the gossip is true, you have some reason to question it, or if you choose to publish the gossip, you've actually acted in reckless disregard for the truth, and those are some input, um, bits and pieces. Now, negligence, Apart from actual malice, this is failure to apply some diligence that a reasonable person would apply in a similar situation. For a reporter, this includes not the following. Um, you know, it's, it's not really following good journalism practice. And the example that I have at the bottom here, which preemptively to say not the following, is this whole notion of having the three credible sources 
and the fact that Prince Harry, he was able to file a lawsuit um, in, in terms of, you know, what was being said about him after he, he um, you know, got married. We know the scandals that exist in terms of his life with Meghan Markle. So it's this whole notion of, you know what? Here's some information. He actually, you know, left the, the military. He did X and he did Y. He did not actually do so, you know. Um, he left on good terms when he got married. He, his time was up. So he soon, and he was able to get an apology um, from, from, from that particular newspaper, the, you know, on the Daily Mail. It's, it's because some of these newspapers do not necessarily do fact checking. And we know that the BBC and, you know, those types of media houses that are, are actually reputed, you know, they're reputed for having really thorough journalistic practices. In this particular case, they did not check. And so he proved that there was negligence in terms of the way in which they actually did not confirm the allegations that they got because they were basically looking for scoops. And th that's the time and the period that they're still actually doing um, what we call yellow journalism in terms of making a story or an issue out of somebody who is a very public figure as the prince is. Now, negligence and malice, the significance of this is that you can have damages and the standard of proof of different individuals are actually determined by negligence and malice. Here's how they were part of the civil rights movement. So the New York Times versus Sullivan case of 1964, um, and of course, this is from the Bill of Rights Institute. The time period was 1960. Civil rights leaders actually ran a full page ad in the New York Times to raise funds to help civil rights leaders, including the late Dr. Martin Luther King, and of course, six to well-known Americans sign bill. Um, the ad actually, that's what they signed. The ad described what it called an unprecedented wave of terror police actions against peaceful demonstrators in Montgomery, Alabama. And of course, the ad described, you know, what was happening. Most of it was accurate, but a lot of it was not true. There was exaggeration. They said that police rain uh, a college uh, campus where protesters were. And of course, a false statement really was, uh, you know, the ad said when the entire student body protested, the state authorities by refusing to re-register, their dining hall was padlocked in an attempt to starve them into submission. So the two clauses that were established here in the case of New York Times versus Solomon would have been um, exaggeration and falsity or a false statement, all right? So L.B. Sullivan, he was one of three people in charge of the police in Montgomery. He sued the New York Times for libel or printing something they knew to be false and would cause harm because at that time in society, this was a sensitive period in the era of the civil rights fight in the U.S. And so publishing anything that would stimulate the angst of people already anxious about those movements, um, it would cause harm. And so the ad did not mention his name, but he claimed that the ad implied his responsibility for the actions of the police and damaged his reputation in the community. The Alabama court, uh, you know, they awarded him half a million dollars in damages and New York Times was made to pay because of what they actually implied in the context of an unprecedented wave of terror of police actions against peaceful demonstrators in Montgomery. So you're pitting the police against the public and the demonstrators. That's what the case was actually seen as in the context of what the New York Times actually implied in the story. And so that's the reason why they were ordered to pay, but they went straight to the Supreme Court and they argued that there was absolutely no intention of harm as they had no reason to believe that the ad included false statements. They published, but they had no reason to believe it was falsely put there. And of course they argued that if the newspaper had to check for the accuracy of every criticism of every public official, a free press would be severely limited. So guess what? The, the Supreme Court ruled in their favor. And in order to prove libel, a public official, the lesson here is that a public official must show that the newspaper acted with actual malice. And of course, knowledge that it was false or with reckless disregard for the truth. In defense of the Supreme, um, of, of, of the Supreme Court's decision, in defense of the New York Times, what the Supreme Court was actually saying is that, you know, you've got to prove actual malice because what the New York Times was actually doing was publishing or printing an ad that they saw as not necessarily something that was um, malicious against the 
Sullivan died, all right? So again, America's profound national commitments to the principle that debates on public issues should be uninhibited, robust and wide open was part of what the Supreme Court actually said. Further, that the free and open debate about the conduct of public officials uh, was more important than occasional honest factual errors that might hurt or damage officials' reputations. So it's a situation where, again, the New York Times won against this public individual or this public official um, because there was not a, you know, proof of actual malice committed against Sullivan. Now, there are a couple of classifications of defamation in terms of the plaintiffs, the types of people. As New York Times versus Sullivan established, not all defamation plaintiffs are the same. And this is where we come to those discussions around who can actually expect to be kept, um, you know, in, in terms of the court system, who can actually expect and we're going to come to privacy in our next module. Um, there are four types of people that you will see in the public domain in the courts when it comes to defamation. First is that public or what we call um, public figure or official. Politicians, high-ranking government officials, those who hold elected office as well as government employees, who appear to have substantial control over government affairs but may not actually have any power. The press secretary, um, the press secretary, we can, we can say that the press secretary is really a glorified PR practitioner, but the press secretary is said to be very powerful thanks to the regular press briefings at the White House. And we know that the current press secretary has come under fire recently for statements about, you know, even the FBI's presence on the president's property in terms of declassified documents. And so everything that the press secretary says, in some cases, the press will take that um, to mean that, you know, the person misrepresented the truth, all right? So as a public figure, a public official, anyone who's close to the president, the president is the highest public official in the land, the vice president, all of those particular individuals, they're actually public officials. And so the standard of proof that they've got to bring to the court is actual malice. Then apart from the public official or the public figure, we have what we call the all-purpose public figures people who are instantly recognized by everyone, by many. These are actors, actresses, all celebrities, you know. So we have Angelina Jolie here and Brad Pitt, you know, you've got different people, you know, Serena and Venus Williams, you, you know, Denzel Washington, you name them. Anybody who's in the public like for one particular activity or another, you know, they're all all-purpose public figures regardless um, why they're famous. And you will see, if you look at that video that I posted on D2L, that these particular public figures, and many of them, they won their cases. They took um, publications to task for defamation, and some of them won their cases. The very public issue of uh, the defamation case with Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, that was played out in the public domain because they are all-purpose public figures. Look at those particular cases and how they actually evolved, all right? So the standard of proof that they've got to bring to the court is that those particular publications have actually, um, you know, engaged in actual malice, all right? And of course, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt were able to win a case earlier than they did their divorce in terms of uh, the, the rumors that were published about their split and stuff like that. So that predated their actual split. Now, we've also got what we call limited purpose public figures. So apart from those who are public or uh, figures or public officials and all purpose public figures, we've got limited purpose figures, individuals who have thrust themselves to the forefront of a controversy and they actively seek the spotlight. So Greta Thunberg, who sailed the Atlantic Ocean to raise awareness for climate change, this young woman, um, we know that she was really a, a limited purpose public figure. Um, we've also got those public figures who are actually classified as accidental because they were thrust into the spotlight purely by accident. And this example here of Oliver Sippel, who saved President Ford from an assassination attempt, he was, usually, he was seen as a limited purpose public figure. All right. Now, classifications of defamation and proof, um, really the standard of proof, it, it, it's really classified if the defamatory remarks are related to the underlying reason for which the individuals are known um, in terms of the standard of proof of actual malice. So. If it is that they are proving that because they are actually out there in the public and there is a malice against them because of their notoriety, um, they've got to actually prove that, 
you know, the person who actually defamed them knew that they were public figure. If the remarks were actually related to their private lives and the court finds that the public no longer has independent interest in those matters, they're deemed private individuals and the standard of proof is actual, it's, it's known as negligence. So actual malice and negligence are two types of defamation plaintiffs. And these are the things that they've got to prove in the court. Then we come to the classification of the fourth type of individual who is the private individual. You might be a private individual. I can be classified as a private individual. Um, if you're not famous, all right, you've got to prove negligence in the court there in the context of your defamation suit. Now, you can sue for damages and injury in the case of defamation. And so injury and damages are different. Um, I'd like you to get those particular distinctions. Injury is the burden placed on the plaintiff as a result of the, defam the, the, the defamatory publication. So, um, you know, you have actually, you know, lost your reputation, you've lost your job, you've had some serious lack of sleep, you know, uh, you cannot walk without people pointing you out. So you've got to prove that there is really injury as a result of the type of stresses that have been brought on you as a result of the publication. And you can sue for damages as a result of the injury. Now, the damages, this is the compensation that you're receiving. Now, there are a couple of types of damages. There are three. So actual damages really would be your provable, tangible losses as a result of the defamation. All right. So you have actually lost property. All your tenants have decided to move out. You have lost your job. You've lost all your clients. And so you're showing the proof. All right of loss of pecuniary prospects or your finances. Your business has actually taken a nosedive. People have pulled out of deals as a result of the publication. So you're showing that the previous year you made 1 million. And when the publication was actually brought to the public um, you know, knowledge, when it was published all over, you went from $1 million to a mere $10,000 because you've just got maybe five or six loyal customers, maybe your family members who still believe in you, all right? Or your business has gone into bankruptcy totally as a result of the actual damage. So actual damages, they have to be provable or tangible with the bills. And of course, the intangible losses, you've been taking um, you know, medication because of your pain and suffering, the shame you've experienced, you've been seeing a psychologist. So you're presenting those types of documents to show that you've been under um, you know, therapy ongoing therapy as a result of the particular, um, you know, stress and the psychology of, of what you've been going through, the psychological effects of the publication. Now, presumed damages, you can also actually have that. So you can act, you can have actual and presumed, presumed damages. If the court really believes that, you know, the result from any defamatory publication, if you can't actually prove it, um, if you can't prove that you've lost your reputation, the court can actually assign a dollar value. If you had, let's say, a net worth of $10 million before, and as a result of you know, falling out with the public, you've been tried in the court of opinion, in the public there, the court can actually say, well, we're going to rule in favor of the plaintiff, um, and we're ruling that the New York Times or the Washington Post issue $100 million to recover those particular losses. Then they can talk about that in the context of what they knew your worth and reputation to be before, all right? Now, here's something to note. Presumed damages are not available for slander or defamation for fraud, meaning there has to be proof. It has to be liable per se, meaning that you've got to name the person, identify them, they've got to establish malice has taken place, and of course, falsity and identification. So please remember all of those particular bits and pieces of how it is that someone can actually sue for libel, and of course, we said that this has to do some do with something that is actually written um, in terms of broadcast. It's going to be slander, and it's really under the classification of defamation. All right. So those are the damages that are actually not indirect, but they're 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 actually um, being brought to the court's attention because it's libel per se, meaning that it's expressly stated against the individual who's filing the particular case. Now, punitive damages are awarded to punish the defendant to prevent future misconduct. 
So if there is someone who is a blogger and who's always in the habit of actually saying false things about an individual, then you can have punitive damages where you can actually bar them from publishing, all right? Um, if it's established that it's falsity. You can actually say to them, you will have to pay for the person's counseling sessions for the next year. But again, the plaintiff has to prove actual malice regardless of the type of individual they're suing. So there has to be actual malice. Let's say when the Williams, you know, there's truthfulness and there's falsity. And there was falsity found by the court in terms of what she was actually saying about the individual. Then you can have the court say that, you know, punitive damage, um, damages in the case of, 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 you know, Williams against Smith, um, something that you said that was not necessarily truthful, um, we will bar you from actually um, broadcasting or bringing gossip in the future, all right? So it's the lifestyle um, type of program. It's whatever you're doing. The plaintiff has to prove that there is actual malice in, in terms of the individual that they're suing. Now, libel and defamation, there are quite a few cases that I'd like for you to look at. There are some videos that I posted there that I'd like for you to access as well, um, including the PDFs of the videos versus Chronicle and the content posted on D2L. It will all help you, it will all bring together how it is that you found, um, you know, cases happening in the public, playing out in the public, and how it is that the First Amendment and issues around what is not protected can actually be used against someone, that it's a company, an individual, a newspaper, to actually, um, you know, bring to the public's attention how someone has been defamed. So that is it for this particular module here on defamation, libel, and slander. In our next session, we're going to actually look at privacy and issues around breach of privacy and how it is you can try to safeguard your private space in the context of defamation, even defamation, libel, and slander, and who can actually expect a modicum of privacy, so to speak. So that's it for today's module. Uh, like I said, in the next session, you can expect us to look at issues of privacy.